four months ago, this is what my drive looked like. And you could go down the tunnel system from inside my house and you would reach a dead end as there is more digging to be done. So we started digging the drive up, but we realised this was going to be much too hard. So we got the digger in and made a huge hole. Oh my God, what have I done? There is no going back. But what am I doing this for? So I'm building an underground garage linked to the tunnels which go up into my house so my DeLorean can rise up out of the ground. Subscribe, this is gonna to be totally awesome. This is the biggest DIY project on the internet. Well, it's getting there. Right, Colin, what have you been up to? Is this the year, people, when the DeLorean comes up at the drive? Okay, welcome to Secret Garage Update 3. Now then, people that have been subscribed to the second channel, thank you very much. It has passed a million subscribers. Absolutely amazing. You've been watching all the construction, some of the long form videos of how this thing's been built. Now, today in this video, I'm gonna talk about the design, talk about the whys, because let's face it, I've been doing things in completely the wrong order. It's been making my life difficult, as well as the weather. Now, up until now, this has been my CAD model, my cardboard aided design, as to what's happening and what's going on. But there's a lot of questions, and a lot of people are obviously not quite understanding the scope and the full picture of this project. So I think we need, in true Doc Brown style, we need a model. Uh, sorry for the crudeness, uh, and it's not quite to scale. Actually, that is totally not true. It is bang on scale, but you've got to get you back to the future references in, haven't you? <laughs> now, as you can see, this is to scale. Basically, 10 centimetres on here is one metre in reality, so I think that makes this a 10 to 1 scale. Now, unfortunately, my DeLorean, I think, is 18 to 1, so it looks a little bit lost. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Need to find a bigger DeLorean model. So you can see where we're at. We've got the tunnel sticking out down here, just below the house, very nice. And then basically we've dug up to this little line here. That's what we've excavated so far. And of course the bit of room that we've made is this. So this bit here goes in here. That is what has been constructed so far. So here we are in that beautifully fabricated steel room. Now, while I was doing this, or particularly when I was doing the ceiling, that's when I looked up and I thought, there is a lot of concrete going over the top of this. It's not just really thick, but it's also really wide. And at that point I thought, I better just get this double checked. So my design consisted of the steel room set in the concrete with some vertical steel joists welded to the side of the wall, mirrored on both sides, and of course across the top was some even bigger steel joists. So at a central point here, the concrete was looking about being five to 600 mil thick. And of course that across the whole thing, that's a lot of weight that is. So had a structural engineer check this, this part, actually okay. It's in the reinforcing mesh application where things started to differ. Right, so here's Colin's rebar. He just slides that down into the concrete for the floor slab, which by the way was a nightmare to put in. We're not doing that like that. I'll get onto that later. But as well as that, Mr. Structural Man, he wanted a second one right up against the wall behind it. Now, that would have been okay. I'll just slide another one. But no, there's more complications. He just didn't want it flat. He wanted it bending and tying in to that bottom floor slab so it keys into the bottom bit. And as difficult as this was to get in, it does make sense. Which I can demonstrate with this wonderful test. Now, all the forces on my walls are coming from the weight of the ceiling, the expansion of the clay and the rock, basically trying to push itself into the room. Now, if you can imagine this is the reinforced mesh in the concrete, when something is pushing against it, it's trying to bend it, but also as it bends, it loses height, it gets shorter. So basically what that's doing is it's pulling on the top slab and pulling up on the floor. And by bending that rebar round, you divert some of those forces so they're not just pulling up, but they're pulling across and then they're pulling on the whole concrete slab going across the floor, distributing that load even further. Now we can calculate these forces quite precisely because I had a geotechnical survey done. And this is basically a dude which comes out, takes rock samples and sends them off for crush tests. And then has this little twisty device which he puts into the clay, tells him how firm the clay is. Tested it, we're in firm clay. What, what's after firm? 
Can you get is them? After firm is stiff. Stiff. Stiff, stiff very, after firm. Very stiff. Then very stiff. We got a firm on we are. <laughs> now it's about five minutes into the video and before you see me struggle trying to get this bent rebar in and actually bend the rebar, it's time for this. Choose a sponsor, choose a VPN, choose Surfshark, choose to be safe on public Wi-Fi so the people next to you in that coffee shop can't steal your passwords and data. Choose to protect your privacy by changing your IP address to one that can't be connected to your digital identity. Choose to protect unlimited devices in your family from one policy. Choose to surf in a web with no ads, trackers, malware, with a clean web feature. Choose a service that doesn't track or store what you do online. Choose camouflage mode, so even your internet provider doesn't know you're using a VPN. Choose to watch shows outside the subscribe region or stream native services while away, like sports and catch-up. And choose 24-7 expert support and live chat. And choose to get three months extra free at the link in the description or by scanning the QR code on the screen now. So choose Surfshark, they're a lovely sponsor. Now let's see how I choose to bend this rebar. Now despite only being 10mm thick, rebar is pretty strong and very difficult to bend. So I fabricated myself a little bending device which you just slot on and it makes it very slightly easier. <laughs> but the problems don't end there. Now getting this round and under here is going to be a bit of a peg. Trimming the rebar, trimming the rocks, getting it stuck getting me stuck. Working in a confined space, this was a tricky job. <laughs> now adding to this already difficult job is the fact that in an ideal world, this stuff doesn't want to be touching anything other than concrete. Doesn't want to be touching the ground, doesn't want to be touching my steel room. So as well as trying to bend it and fish it under the floor, I need to hold it in a position so when the concrete comes down, it doesn't shove it and move it all around and get it in the wrong place. Now we achieve this by welding pegs onto the steel room and onto the rebar to hold it into position. And this worked an absolute treat. Even with concrete flooding around it, it never shifted it anywhere and once it's all set we're good to go with the next bit. So we're left with this about 400 mil of rebar sticking out of the concrete and the 400 mil is important because every time we join our rebar we have to go 40 times its diameter. If it's 10 mil of course that gives us 400 mil. Boom. So now we need to bring another bit down and overlap it and connect it onto our rebar but it still has to not touch the room and then of course after that we need a secondary layer in front of that one. Now to attach this rebar to the lower part, there's two common methods. You got old school with a tie and a tie wrap, wrap it round, hook it on, spin it until it goes tight and then just fold it over. Or there's the modern method. One of these, a tie gun. Basically just put the jaws over it, pull the trigger and it ties it automatically. Absolutely fantastic, saved me so much time. With the pegs we welded on to hold the rebar in place removed, we carefully lowered the new rebar down into the garage. I proceeded to put it into place, tie it to our bottom bit of rebar. I then bent individual pieces to tie to our vertical rebar to wrap around the corner to form a continuous mesh. Then with the secondary layer fitted and spaced off, it's time to fill it in with concrete. Now, it's very difficult to know how much concrete you're going to need. So for this project, we've been using a volumetric mixer. This is basically a cement mixer, which has separate bays for the sand and the gravel and the concrete. They come down a conveyor belt, mix at the entry port, and then of course you can use as much or as little as you want. And also you can make it as wet or as dry as you want, or you can change it halfway through the process. This is ideal for our application to get it flowing at the right consistency and to the level we require. That's all gone off nicely. As you can see in there. Now, we didn't form this whole wall in one concrete pour for two reasons. The first one is weight. Concrete is heavy. When we were doing the bunker, we absolutely piled loads of concrete down on top of the tunnel and we noticed a very slight bow forming in the walls. So to mitigate that, we just distributed the concrete more evenly, but these walls are a lot taller. This room is a lot higher. They're gonna suffer from that even more. So. We've got thicker box section, but also down this side wall, we put a load of 45 degree braces to properly hold it up. And if you remember when I actually built the room, I had these plates with all the little circular holes in. So we're halfway up, they'll get knitted in. So once it goes off, they're proper solid, it's good. And now the second reason is damp proof membrane. Now the damp proof membrane doesn't come all the way down to the bottom because at this layer of the rock, 
This is better draining than anything. When we dug the tunnel, anything below this point was bone dry the whole time we've done it. Any moisture or water that gets down to here will just dissipate through the rock. But as well as this, we want the concrete to fill in all these gaps, so like properly stitch it into the ground, because any stress, is any force, is any movement pushing against the room, the more it's connected to its surrounding area, the better. So, bit of damp proof membrane down to there. Fantastic. There's your second pour. Boom. Right, we've got a rebar up, we've got a membrane down, and we've got concrete to here. The last part we need to do to complete these walls is to add a horizontal RSJ beam across here. Now this is to basically take the expansion of the clay because this top seam is in the clay. When that gets wet, it expands. It is gonna push on these walls with a lot more force. So that is to basically keep the whole room level and straight across the whole thing. All good. And then we need to get some rebar and attach it over the top here to knit the two bits together. And we do this with these little hoops, which I've had preformed, very nice. And this isn't just to uh, make it look very nice because the whole thing runs around nice and level, it does look very good. It's so when we do the rebar going across the top, which of course needs to take all the weight of the vehicles, it all ties in and knits together. So that goes onto there like so. Then there's a lower one, which will also come underneath those beams and the whole thing will stitch in and that is where all our strength is. So got my rebar walls formed and we've got a bit of shutter in shuttered this end off here, just underneath the horizontal bar, filled that up with concrete, and that gives us like a bit of a boundary wall. And of course, remove the plywood. You can see that looks very nice. We've got an extra bit of rebar, which is gonna head over the roof as well. Then after that, we took all the lead off and everything, and it can expose the project for the actual scale it is. And that brings us back to the future, back to the present day. Now, I've been working on this for about three to four months, which is a very long time, but this was always gonna be the most difficult part. Getting this all set out, getting it aligned, taking the time to measure everything, cross-reference it, making sure we're building this in the right place, because it has to be parallel with the house. The garage, the garden, and everything are all funny angles and all go off at a different tangent. So I can't use them as references. So I had to use the house, and we're not quite under the house yet. So this was all have to be done off the walls, which we can't see from down inside the hole. So what's left to do with this bit? Well, first off, the concrete, which goes down up to the little boundary wall we've poured, and across the top of this RSJ, that's all gonna be done with a lighter grade concrete. And because it's so big, it'd be a victim of its own weight. But we're not gonna cast that yet. We're gonna wait till we've finished doing the whole room. Now then, what is next, Colin? We need to dig a bit more out, but how much more? Okay, I hope this bit is gonna clear up a lot of the questions as to what this project is all about, where it's going and where everything fits in. So, the next dig. We cannot dig a massive hole as wide as what we've done before because we've got the doorway and the house to worry about. If we undermine this little door frame here and this pillar here too much, then we risk destabilizing that and possibly having some cracks form in the walls. So, we need to dig up to about the side of the door there and straight down. But as well as that, we need to go a little bit deeper as well. Now, if I get my extra piece of model, this is stage two. So that is the next bit of room that we need to fork. Now, I don't know if you noticed on all the reinforcement that come down here and everything, there was all the bars sticking out, all the 400 mil bars. We've got that to build off. So this bit is gonna be a lot easier because we're not having to worry about where everything is. We're just extending the room. Now, I know what you're saying, Colin, why is it going a little bit deeper? Well, we've got the car to worry about and how it gets lifted in and out. And where is that happening? That is happening here. Now I'll get the rest of the model. I hope I can do this without knocking the camera. This is the rest of the room. It is gonna be big. Look at that. This is the grand plan, people. So the car will come up out the floor here. Where's my DeLorean? I've been looking online for a bigger one, can't find one. Even the Playmobil one is the same size as this. The Lego one might be fractionally bigger. 
you will drive onto the drive. This bit here will have a lift mechanism and the whole thing will lower down, down into there. And then I'm gonna have a turntable system so the whole thing can turn around. And then when it comes back up again, you'll be able to drive off forward. Amazing, we can all agree that that is gonna be the best thing ever to happen to a three bed semi-detached. Now, the reason why this bit has to go deeper is because when this floor lowers down, obviously part of this lift mechanism has got to go into the floor because I want the floor to remain completely level. I don't want you to walk into the room and then the car be up on a plinth or anything like that. I want it all to be level. So that has got to sink into the floor. Now, the exact depth of this, I'm not totally sure yet, but I've got a rough idea. It's probably going to be the same distance as the bottom of this horizontal bar to the surface because when the floor comes up, this is kind of like a bit of a point where we can't go past very easily with the lift mechanism because that sticks out past the wall of the actual roof. And it's the turning of the car, which is why it has to get lower over here and not just underneath the car. Because if you can imagine like a massive circular disc that's got to turn round, that's got to sink into the floor as well. Hence why the floor is lower right over here and right over here. As this is to scale, you could see if I put the camera in here, it's going to be a big old room, but this is what we've got to do. So there is a lot of work ahead of me, a lot of work. But as you can see, it's going to be epic. Now this hole here is just purely so you can see through it, but I have left another hole over there because there's been so many requests for you to still be able to see the rock because obviously the rock face wall we've got at the moment does look pretty cool. And when you come around the corner and you see that, it is kind of impressive. So I am going to try and leave that exposed I am worried it is gonna condensate up and it's constantly be getting, getting wet and damp on the other side of the glass, not the room side, the other side. Now, you can use those systems that they're using skyscrapers with like a magnet and a squeegee that you could go around, but if it gets to that point, I might make it so if it doesn't work, you can kind of retrofill it in and go over it because I don't think we want, you know, condensation and stuff everywhere. Got enough problems with that at the minute. That is the grand scheme of things. We shall do this bit next, just up to the doorway, and then this bit will probably be done in another two sections. Yes, there is a lot of work for me to do. A lot of work, but it's gonna be well worth the effort. Now, before we dig this next bit, there's a little bit of prep that we need to do outside before we go digging out a load more. First up we need to do a little bit of power weeding and pulling a tree up with the JCB. But fear not people, I don't believe in chucking trees away and it has been replanted in the countryside, although I think the journey has took its toll on it slightly. Fingers crossed it pulls through. Then next up we set out some supports to move the massive metal thing we made originally that the van was going to park on while we dug underneath it. Then it's time to remove the boundary stone between me and my neighbour's driveway, which of course I will be replacing afterwards, to add some tracking down. Now what this is, is to save the gardens being completely chewed up by the JCB and Tom when he brings a digger in for the second time. This is the sort of stuff that you get events that you put down on like concerts and stuff, so this will keep the ground protected while we drive all over it. And then it started raining again. I'm like, come on weather, Tom is ready with his digger. Okay, we're all ready to dig some more out. Now, of course, the next bit of room is gonna be 1200 mil. It's gonna be that because that's the thickness of a sheet of metal. Now, this time we're gonna put the reinforcing mesh and everything down first. We'll put it up the walls and everything before we even start building the room. And if you're wondering, well, why didn't you do that before, Colin? I've been doing the tunnel for like two or three years and the methods of which we use there are kind of ingrained into my head and I just continued it coming out here. But of course the tunnel's slightly different. It's a smaller room, it's not so high. The concrete walls are, if not just as thick as what we're using here, and what we used there was fibrous concrete where you get like the polymers mixed into the concrete and that's kind of like reinforcement but within the concrete. Now that is okay for the tunnel but out here of course we need to be a little bit more stronger because we've got cars, we've got all sorts, you've got the width, the height and everything all to consider. So we'll put the stuff in first and then we'll build the room and then we'll put the concrete around the sides and everything afterwards. But you don't need to worry about that, that's my problem. And if you have a look in here, look, little milk and tea mugs, they're still available on the website. Thank you very much to Barrett Steel for uh, supplying all the steel for this. I'm sort of keeping a, an eye on cost, so at the end I can give a, a note as to how much this costs. If you want to try and guess how much this whole thing is going to cost by the time it's finished, that's a good thing to put in the comments. And if you've got any other questions, put them in as well, because I'm going to do a questions video on the second channel next. Because even though I've done my best to explain what I can here, there's no doubt going to be things I've missed or things that I've explained in a slightly weird way, which I think's okay, but you guys might not. So. 
they are. That is the project. Subscribe, don't miss any of this. It's obviously gonna take a long time. I wanna try and get it done this year, but I'm gonna have a couple of weeks off it now because I'm kind of, after working for three or four months on this thing, I'm sick of the sight of limestone. So I'm just gonna go and do something quick and then I'm gonna come back on it. And hopefully the weather will have improved as well because we have had, officially, the wettest February ever. And boy, do I know about it. Right, see you in the next one. <laughs> I hope you like the model though. All those times it was raining and I couldn't get on, I was making this. And it kind of feels kind of retro, isn't it, to have a model, whereas everything now is done on like computer simulations and stuff. This is cool!